Hey guys, this is Joe Harper with Reform Truth or Ministries. Today's video is about the topic of what are stars according to Flat Earth cosmology. Stars are a really fascinating phenomenon. For those who have studied astronomy, we know that stars, um, they move in their orbits, in their circuits, and that they, they always return back to the place where they began that those who have observed um, the movement of stars know that they they do move in perfect circles above us that that this is a phenomenon known as stellar parallax where those who have even done this with cameras over the long periods of time have noticed that stars always return back to where they begun and this is evidence to those who are paying attention that stars are not what we've been told to believe we're told that we're um, orbiting our sun which is a star which is moving through space at so many thousands upon thousands of miles per hour we're told that all of the stars in the universe are moving and that there's a, a part of a very complex movement of the heavenly bodies but in reality the truth right in front of our eyes is that stars are moving in perfect orbits above us and returning back that the constellations always come back to the place where they began that the stars always come back to the place where they began and the exception to this is the north star polaris which is always um it's always due north no matter where you are that it's that star is the one that does not move and what this reveals is that the stars are moving above us in perfect circles above our flat expanse of our earth and it shows that the north star is at the the center of our earth and it does not move so we see that if you were sample a good illustration for this is what you observe in a planetarium when one goes into a planetarium they notice that it is always shaped like a dome and that that's essentially what the stars are like above us inside the firmament is that they are moving in perfect circles above us and that the illustration of it being a, a planetarium always looks like a dome it gives us some context of what is truly going on but then the question begs it the question begs is then what are stars because we know that they are not they're not balls of gas that are infinitely larger than our planet and that our earth is not a planet and that therefore we have to beg the question of what are stars and that this question can be answered by looking to the scriptures and that when one gives careful study to what the scriptures say we discover that it actually has a good deal to say about what are stars and we see that they are not balls of gas but in fact that they are living beings and as a matter of fact that they are described in scripture as being angels and that we see that certain of God's angels have been given the task to be up in the heavens and giving off that light that we see from the stars and that they have a purpose of declaring God's message through general revelation to the earth and that we see that these stars are in fact angels and there's a, a number of different places where this can be seen I think a very famous example of this is in the book of Job chapter 38 verse 7 and this verse says I'm gonna start at verse 6 whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened or who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy so this is an interesting verse because it's talking about when the foundation of the earth was laid and it says that the morning stars sang together and that all of the sons of God shouted for joy. Now we know that the sons of God shouting for joy is referring to the angels. But the question is, what about the morning stars that sang when the foundation of the earth was laid? And this puzzled me for a long time because I was thinking, couldn't it be the same thing as angels that are listed afterward as the sons of God? But study of this has shown that it's, there's a, a method here in the Hebrew that often happens where the same thing will be repeated in Hebrew for emphasis. So the morning stars shouting, singing for joy, and the sons of God shouting that these are in fact the same B 
beings that are being repeated two times for emphasis and that this can be confirmed for from studying the rest of the scriptures and another good point out is that we see that the stars are often referred to in the scriptures as the heavenly hosts and this is referring to the armies of God and that if we go for example to Isaiah 34 4 we see that the stars are referred to as the heavenly host and the word for host in the Hebrew is in fact armies it means the armies and this is referring to the beings of the angels and that this is very telling because of the fact that it it shows that that stars and angels are in fact the same thing that the scriptures are describing the same the same beings the same entities with the the word stars and angels and even the word host for that matter but that being said Isaiah 34 4 says and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll and their host shall fall down and the leaf falleth off from the vine as falling from the fig from the fig tree so we see here that this is talking about the things that will go on in the heavenly bodies in the future and it says that that all of the hosts of heaven will be dissolved and the heavens will be rolled together as a scroll and all of their hosts shall fall down and their leaf fall from the vine and from the fig tree now this is talking about the day the great day of the lord when christ will return and that that upon this day that, that the heavens are going to be rolled back like a scroll and that the, the heavenly host will be dissolved. So this is referring to the stars, but the point here as I made before is the fact that we see that the stars are referred to as the heavenly host, the hosts of heaven, the armies of heaven. So we see that they are indeed being. So we see that, that stars sing, we see that they are called the heavenly host, we call the army, and we even see in scripture that they are said that God has named every single individual star. And this is found in Psalm 147, 3. 3 through 3 and, or uh, Psalm 147, 4. And Psalm 147, 4 says, He telleth the number of the stars, and he calleth them all by their names. Now this is very fascinating because the fact that why would God go to the trouble to name every single individual star? Is and the, the implication of that is that they are in fact personal beings, that they are in fact beings that are living, that they are active, that they have a mind and a conscience and all of these things that beings have, that that would show that the fact that that is why God has gone to the trouble to name them all by name. And that this shows that these are beings that are serving the Lord and that that, that God has placed them in the heavens for a purpose and that this, the movement of the stars, the illumination of the stars, it has a purpose that God has, he, God is using the stars or using the angels that are up in the heavenly bodies to declare his purpose unto humanity. And this is showing that the heavens, even, even the, the heavens below the firmament that are not, quote, the heaven of heavens, that this is a, uh, a place of angelic beings that is a territory that is not um, set aside for humans but it is a it is a realm that is set aside for the angelic beings up in the higher places and it's fascinating how those who have studied ufos or quote unquote aliens that they have said that when you they've claimed that those at nasa or those who use the world government systems they constantly are seeing things up there that are moving around in erratic behaviors not just the stars but they're seeing these beings that are moving in and out of their telescopes or in, in front of their their cameras or their sights and we see this and this is because of the fact that the heavens are declared to be the territory of the lord and that we see that we see this described very clearly in Psalm 115:16, where it says, The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. So we see a distinction between the fact that there is a division between the earth, which belongs to men, that God has given to men, and the heavens, which belongs to God. And this is 
the dwelling place of the angels. So we're seeing a very clear description here in the scriptures and that those who have studied these phenomenons, even these UFO phenomenons, have come to realize that, that, that there are beings or entities moving around up there that can't be explained by conventional science. And this is explained when we know the fact that the vast majority of UFO phenomenons, they're not, quote, extraterrestrials. They're not aliens from other planets, but instead they are, in fact, either angels or most of the time they are fallen angels they are demonic beings that are at work to deceive humanity and we know that there is warfare going on that humans do not see between the good angels and the bad but there is there's these spiritual realities that are going on that we cannot see with our physical eyes but the scriptures tell us that they are so but once again we, there are other reasons why we know that the stars described in the Bible are in fact angels. And we see this being talked about in a number of places. And a good example of this is in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1 verse 20 explicitly says that, that the stars that are being talked about in that book are referring to the angels. And... Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. Verse 20 reads, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Now we know that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book, that there's a great deal of symbolism. But it's important to recognize that even God's symbolism, it often comes from literal realities. That we see that, that the Bible and the, rest of the, and the rest of the scriptures may perfectly describe that the stars are being talked about as angels. And that the symbolism of Revelation can reinforce this with there being no contradiction. Because just because of the fact that the book is symbolic in nature and it is a prophecy, that often God's symbolism can come from literal, literal realities. So when it says in Revelation 1.20 that, that the stars which you saw us are angels, that can have a symbolic meaning for the context of the prophecy, but that can be stemmed from the literal teaching of scripture in the rest of the Bible that the, that the stars are in fact angels and there's no contradiction. And another good example of this is in Revelation 12. Um, Revelation 12, verses 3 through 8, talking about the angelic rebellion. And here it says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, seven crowns upon his head. And his, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man-child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was a war in heaven... Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was there any place found any more in heaven. So we see here that there's being talked about how the dragon here symbolizes the devil, and this has been essentially undisputed by theologians in church history, and that it says that when he um, cast a third of the stars out of heaven, that that is referring to a third of the total number of angels that there were that joined Satan in his rebellion. And we see that in verse 7, it talks about how Michael and his angels and the dragon, referring to the devil, and his angels fought against each other. So when, when, when one is able to put verse 3 and verse 7 together, it's pretty clear that the stars that were cast out of heaven, a third of the stars, that they are in fact referring to the angels. So we see from this that the Bible tells us that the stars are in fact the angels and that the heavens where the stars and the other heavenly bodies are, that this is the territory of God, that earth is the realm of men, but that the heavens is the realm of God and his angels which he has created. So we see that the stars are moving on the courses set by God because they are in fact God's servants 
serving a purpose of declaring God's message unto humanity. But another question is, what about the planets? What about the heavenly bodies that we know to be the planets? And this is a great question because of the fact that those who understand flat earth cosmology know that the planets are not these other worlds, or they're not these these huge um, spheres in space, space that are orbiting our sun. But in fact, that we but we do know that they are heavenly bodies that we are able to see from the Earth through telescopes and other such means of observation. And we know that the planets, what we cough often call the planets, they are not moving in the same type of circuits or orbits or courses as the rest of the stars. And this brings brings about the question of why is this phenomenon going on? And that the Bible tells us that there are certain he- heavenly bodies that are referred to as wandering stars. And that these wandering stars, they are moving in courses that are not set by God. And this is especially seen in the book of Jude in verse 13. And that uh, it says here that, and this is in the context of talking about false teachers, it's saying that these false teachers are such as, and in verse 13, raging waves of the sea, foaming out of their own shame. They are as wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now that's that these wandering stars that is said there is wandering uh, there's blackness of darkness reserved for them forever. This is fascinating because this lines up with the book of Jude in verse six, where it says, "And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he has left in everlasting chains under darkness, unto the judgment of the great day." So we obviously see that there is a connection between verse six and verse thirteen. Now, this is especially obvious because they are so closely connected here in the same short epistle. But we also see that the angels, which kept not their first estate, are reserved to everlasting change under darkness. And that these wandering stars, which these false teachers are being compared unto, that they are also reserved to the blackness of darkness forever. So these angels and these wandering stars have the same judgment upon them in Jude 6 and Jude 13. And this is fascinating when it's lined up with the rest of testimony of scripture that I've laid out where the stars are referred to as angels. So these wandering stars are, are angels that are disobedient to God. They, have, they are not serving the Lord and that their movements outside of the orbits that God has set for them that that is in fact showing that they are fallen angels moving about in the heavens in a way which God is not pleased with. And for whatever reason, God has allowed them to do this. But it's showing that the wandering stars are in fact, uh, they're fallen angels. These fallen stars, which we know to be the planets. And the fact of it is that this is interesting because of the fact that in the epistle of Jude, that it is directly uh, appealing to the book of Enoch, which is an extra biblical text, not part of the canon of scripture, but it is, the book of Enoch is a book which does have historical truths contained in it, and at verses 14 and 15 of Jude, which speaks of Enoch and his prophecy of the Lord coming with his saints, that that is a direct quotation from the book of Enoch. Which is not to say that the book of Enoch is inspired, but it's in a historical account which has truth in it. And this refer- this reference to wandering stars is fascinating because of the fact that the book of Enoch speaks of wandering stars reserved for judgment. And this is seen in a few different places in the book of Enoch, but one example is in 1 Enoch chapter 18. And it talks there in, in 1 Enoch 18, 13, it says, I saw there seven stars like great burning mountains. And to me, I inquired regarding them. And the angel said, this place is the end of heaven and earth. And this has become a prison for the stars and the host of seven, and the host of heaven. And the stars which roll over the fire are they which have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in the beginning of their rising, because they did not come out at their appointed times. So we see that first Enoch is describing that there are stars 
and if they are described as angels, and they have been disobedient to the Lord, and that they have been reserved unto judgment. That's fascinating because it lines up with what Jude 13 is saying, this comparison. So we're seeing that there are some realities being talked about here which seem to line up with the teaching of Scripture. And this passage of the book of Enoch is also fascinating for those who believe in flat earth cosmology because of the fact that it talks about how, how Enoch was taken by the angel Uriel to the ends of the earth. And that that is a statement which makes no sense on, on a globe model. And it, here in the same chapter, it talks about how, how that is where Enoch was taken to. At first, Enoch 18, it says in the beginning of the chapter, the first few verses, it says, I saw the treasuries of all the winds. I saw how he had furnished with them the whole creation and the firm foundations of the earth. And I saw the cornerstone of the earth. I saw the four winds which bear the earth and the firmament of heaven. I saw how the winds stretch out the vaults of heaven and have their station between heaven and earth. These are the pillars of the heaven. I saw the winds of heaven which turn and bring the circumference of the sun, the sun and all the stars to their setting. I saw the wind on earth carrying the clouds. I saw the pass of the angels. And I saw at the end of the earth the firmament of the heaven above. And I proceeded and I saw a place which burns day and night where there are seven mountains of magnificent stones, three towards the east and three towards the south. So we see here that that is what is being said is that that Enoch has been taken to the ends of the earth and that this is said multiple times in the book of Enoch. That the, that the book of Enoch can only be understood if, it under, if you understand that it is describing a flat earth cosmology where the statement the ends of the earth makes no sense on a globe and the description of the firmament and the heavens in first enoch is describing the same flat earth cosmology that's found in the scriptures and other jewish and early patristic patristic texts now i've said in other videos in my video on show i said how the nicene creed was describing a flat earth cosmology and that in my other videos on the quotes of the church fathers on some of the early Jews we've seen that all of these historical accounts and they all are these documents or these quotations they're all describing flat earth cosmology and that first Enoch the book of Enoch is describing the same thing which reinforces the amount of evidence for this form of cosmology so we're seeing that, that that lines up, that the statement of, of Enoch being taken to the ends of the earth, that only is possible if you're talking about a flat circular expanse. And that this statement of the ends of the earth is also found in multiple places in the book of Job, such as Job 28.24 and Job 38.13. So that also lines up with what scripture says, this reference to being taken to the ends of the earth, that that's not some type of metaphor, but that's describing um, a literal reality. So, but like I said, we see that Enoch is, the first Enoch is describing that these, these stars, these wandering stars were disobedient angels and that that is fascinating because that seems to line up with what Jude 13 says, these wandering stars. And the fact is that, that this understanding explains a lot of the mystery of the heavenly bodies and that it shows that it's possible to understand the things going on in astronomy and that are consistent with a flatter cosmology and that is indeed fascinating and that these planets are simply they are just stars, similar to the other stars, but they are different because of the fact that they're moving on different orbits. And this would explain the conundrum that some flat Earth cosmologists have had about, say, lunar eclipse, that the, the famous the flat Earth researcher from the 19th century, Samuel Rothbottom, he said of lunar eclipses that it's evident that another heavenly body is moving in front of the moon, and that that is what is moving in front of that's what's causing a lunar eclipse is the same way as the moon moving in front of the Sun clearly causes a solar eclipse now the question is well there's no description of another heavenly body such as the Sun or the moon so how is that possible but when we have this understanding of scripture of wandering stars and that there are stars that are moving in courses that are not 
set by God, when that understanding from Scripture is had, it perfectly explains what we see with lunar eclipses, that there are heavenly bodies that are able to move in front of the moon, which can cause that, and that that um, is able to explain the phenomenon of lunar eclipses. Now this understanding, it requires a more spiritual understanding of what we would refer to as space or the stars. It understands that the scripture may give us the answer, but people must have the spiritual discernment to be able to accept that. And that comes from the grace of God because it shows that these aren't balls of gas, that this isn't just natural phenomenon, but that there are other beings that work above us, above the earth. And that is fascinating. But we know that the powers that be, they have this under, they have greater understanding of space than they're letting on to the rest of the world. There's a reason why, for example, the Vatican, they have huge levels of control over all of the astronomy, the, the, the astronomy um, observatories all over the world, that the most famous example of this is the Lucifer uh, Telescope at Mount Graham in Arizona, where the University of Arizona and the Vatican teamed up to put this observatory on Mount Graham, which was the most sacred mountain to the Native Americans in that part of Arizona. And that they actually did not want that telescope put on that mountain, but that the government sided with the University of Arizona and the Vatican. They essentially were able to strong arm that telescope onto that mountain and that that shows that they are very much aware of there are things going on above us in the heavens that the rest of the world is not privy to and that when they were asked why they have what they're doing with that telescope they said they are looking into deep space for things that may be coming to our earth so they are perfectly aware of the, of the spiritual phenomenon going on up there. The Vatican's aware of that. The Jesuits are aware of that who run the Lucifer Telescope on Mount Graham. And the world governments are aware of this. So they're all watching space very closely, what, what the rest of the world understands as space. But the more biblical description is the heavens. And that they also know that a lot of these phenomena that have been ascribed to aliens are in, in actuality angelic in nature. So there are things going on up there which are mysterious, but that the world governments are watching very closely, which the secret societies are watching very closely, which the Vatican is watching very closely. So it shows that there's things going on that we need to, from a flat earth perspective, from a biblical cosmology perspective, need to continue to study and st need to still pay attention to. But it is wonderful to know that the stars and the planets, that these things can be described from scripture. And even though there's a very different description given than what we may have commonly understood, we know that the Bible does explain these things because the Bible is God's perfect word and it perfectly explains the realities of our world. So that being said, guys, as I always say, look into this stuff, research it, do your own thinking, take it to scripture. But that being said, this is Joe Harper with Reform Truth or Ministries. God bless.